Welcome to No Crying in Talent Ball. Uh, happy to host you. My name is Dave Bacon. Uh, I'm with one of my coworkers, Bailey Crumpton. And we have four amazing panelists here today. Before we get started, a couple things. You can call it housekeeping. Oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to use this. Already I'm failing to follow instructions. Um, uh, my name is Dave Bacon. Uh, I own a technology staffing uh, company called BW Bacon here in Denver. Uh, we started it in 2001. So uh, we are in something like our 21st or 22nd year um, in helping grow companies. And um, I want to say this is the 11th year of Denver Startup Week. And I've been involved in Denver Startup Week in one way or another, uh, either as a panelist uh, or as a speaker and most fondly as a, as a participant. And I think that's a, a big part of the spirit of Denver Startup Week, is just participating, leaning in. Um, I don't know of, a, of an event that has brought the best out of people like Denver Startup Week that I've been a part of. And our city's been through a lot the last couple of years, so have all cities and so have all of us. Uh, and it's awesome to be leaning in again here this year um, with Denver Startup Week, because it, it really does bring the best out of us. So it was just at the headquarters. There's some great energy down there. There's a party right after this. Uh, it's the opening party. Uh, the headquarters for Denver Startup Week is at the uh, Clock Tower, uh, which I think has a new name. I'm not sure what the name is now, but it's, it's DSW HQ. Yes, uh, the Clock Tower itself. It's like the Campanile in uh, Venice. Actually, it's modeled just after that. Um, but uh, so perhaps some of you will meander over there. But Denver Startup Week has meant a lot to, uh, to me and to my team and really to the city of Denver. So I hope you make the most out of this week. Um, before we get started, there is a list of sponsors here and I think we'll put that up on the screen as well. Uh, I want to illuminate sponsorship to all of you. If you are a business owner, if you are a manager, if you're looking to start a new business, these sponsors also lean in on Denver Startup Week. And I think it's our obligation in hosting an event to help try to activate their brands. If you're doing anything that, that might need a new partner, You've got some really uh, uh, energized sponsors here who are ready to, to help you out uh, in any way you can. Um, our title sponsors are Capital One, Dell Technologies, and the Denver Downtown Partnership. Um, so, no crying in talent ball. Uh, my partner Bailey came up with the name for this, uh, uh, this panel. Can anyone tell me the film that this might be associated with? No crying in talent ball. Was that my friend Patrick? A league of their own. Yes. So um, the the irony in no crying in talent ball to me is that there actually is a lot of crying in talent ball, and so like having owned a, a technology staffing business as long as I have, I can tell you that it has been one of the most rewarding experiences that I've ever had, and I have also been dragged through the mud. I have doubted myself. I have questioned what I'm doing, and somehow I keep coming back to finding this space and this place as, as being uh, my, my swim lane. And uh, today we're going to explore uh, you know, ta ta you know, talent strategies within talent, um, and also expand a little bit on this idea of no crying in talent ball, but there is crying. Like, you know, this, this idea. And so as each of you introduce yourselves, uh, it'd be fun if you could share a story of what no crying in talent ball means to you. Are we ready to go? If you ask a question, you get a t-shirt. And we have ski passes at the end, popcorn, drinks, and Sincerely, this isn't like wait till the end to ask a question. If you've got a burning question, let's, let's fire away. Like the idea for us is to give you a certain whiplash effect, some type of takeaways, even if it's one little nugget, maybe a strategy you can take back uh, to your team or something that you can incorporate with your, the next person you hire, then, then you know, that's, that's rewarding for all of us. Let's make this a virtuous circle, shall we? Great, okay. 
Hey everyone, um, I'm Bailey Crumpton. I'm BW Bacon's brand and content manager. I'm so thrilled to be here today with all of you. Welcome to No Crying in Talent Ball. You're all here today because as you know, workplaces, compensation, benefits, and culture are changing and they impact a company's ability to scale and attract and retain talent here in Denver and nationally. We're just gonna talk about some of the challenges with talent acquisition in tech and how we shape the future of work together. So. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Kendra, and she'll just introduce herself. Matt, I'm not sure the microphone's working. It's not designed to work. It's only for the uh, video capture. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> so, if you can't hear us, let us know. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm Kendra Habercorn. I'm with Range Ventures currently, but I've been in the startup scene for the last nine years as head of people at Gr Guild and Craftsy. Um, for our portfolio, I serve as like a head of people on call, and then I work with startups via my own consultancy. I've cried all the time in Talent Ball. Um, I cuss probably more than I cry, but um, I think I'm most moved by the experiences when somebody has like a great opportunity, they get their promotion, and I think we think of crying as a negative thing, but it can be a moving experience too and so I'll lean on those tiers uh, more than the others. Awesome. I'm Sarah McTate. I'm with TurboTenant which is a startup out of Fort Collins that does uh, property management software for uh, landlords. Um, I've been with the company for about four years and um, what does crying and talent ball mean to me? I think I, I tend to agree with you and that you can unlock some of the potential and the people that you work with and when they can see that light bulb moment for themselves, that's just a really gratifying moment to help them grow and just, just be more of themselves. So it's good tears. Uh, I'm Nick Larsh. I'm the senior director of talent at a company called Uninet. We're about a 350 person software company uh, that's uh, fully remote. We're actually in 46 states. Uh, and what no crying talent ball means to me, uh, I think we all, I mean, if you're here for the people session, chances are you like growing and supporting teams uh, and people are crazy. Uh, so sometimes uh, if you're not laughing, sometimes maniacally, uh, you're crying, sometimes hysterically. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what it means to me. Hi, can everybody hear me? Awesome. Uh, my name is Christina Brown. I'm the senior HR manager with Smarter Sorting. We help companies know more and do better. Um, you know, I have realized a lot as far as tears. Um, I think as we all look at LinkedIn and see the recent layoffs and see folks going through that rebuilding process, there are definitely tears involved with starting anew. And, and uh, hopefully we can try as companies to make that process a little easier on folks. Uh, give them the information they need, make sure that they're going into the right environments, create a dynamic partnership for one and all to do their best and, and give their all. So, happy to be here. Thank you all. Now, for our panelists' benefit, uh, can we get a show of hands, just to get a feeling for who's in the audience? Raise your hand if you are in a role in HR or talent acquisition. Good amount of people. Raise your hand if you are a business owner. Couple people. Raise your hand if you're an aspiring business owner. Awesome. Um, looking, for a job? looking for a job. Sorry, that's the other one I was missing. Are you looking for a job right now? So you're a candidate. Super. Two people looking for work back there. Good. Let's help them out. Uh, does that give you a good feel for who's in the audience? Super. All right, Bailey, fire away. So my first question for you guys is kind of about the market. We always talk about this, this term, the market, and it's constantly changing. What do you feel like are the biggest macro factors that influence changes in the market, and how can we better capture what we've learned over the last couple of years? Mm -hmm. I got the mic, so <laughs> I'm take it this. away, <laughs> Nick. Uh, you know, I feel like uh, we're, we've learned a lot over the last uh, few years, but I feel like we're probably not going to always put those learnings into practice. Uh, the market's chaotic, right? We saw people that went out of work super fast, got back to work super fast, and now these companies are right sizing super fast. Uh, so I think one of the things that we've learned is that the market is extremely fluid and it's not predictable. Uh, and that's why, as organizations, we have to be a lot more deliberate about how we grow. And as candidates, we have to be a lot more deliberate about the uh, companies that we're interviewing with, uh, making sure that they're places that we can grow and be successful in. So, anybody else want to tap? 
piggybacking onto that. Um, uh, with regard to what should you do about it, I mean, I think that regardless of the bigger picture environment, there are good habits and great discipline that can help you be successful, like through the ups and downs and turnarounds. And I think that when it comes to talent, it's about building a lean, high-performing team and disproportionately rewarding them so that they retain and they want to stay with you and do great work for not just the near term, not just when someone else like looks at them and hands them a $10,000 raise, they're going to stick with you because they know that there is something of value there. And so I would focus on those things. And I would also focus as a team member, as a leader, in the metrics that matter, that demonstrate true success and motivate people toward those milestones and not the superficial ones that get a lot of press. I think of like fundraising announcements, like focus people on what matters, what drives success, really try and engage them and retain them. And I'm always gonna talk about money, disproportionately reward great people um, and recognize them and show them that you value their contributions. And those are the keys to having a sustainable, strong business, regardless of like what is happening around you. I really like that. If you're a candidate and you're approaching a company, how can what kind of questions can you ask to gauge if companies are able to manage those headwinds? And in the reverse, if you're hiring, how do you answer those types of questions that people may have? So I'll start. Um, I think some questions you can add is around the vision that the company has. What are they trying to do in the market? And does it make sense? Does it actually resonate with what you're trying to do? Do you align with their values? Um, I think values are really important too. A lot of people are talking about values, but not actually walking the values. Um, and so just digging in on those and asking how they display those each day, how they bring them into their team, how they really exercise those each day. Yeah, I mean, I, I could speak for, for my organization. I try to be proactive in sharing some of the things that I think would educate candidates on why we're a growing organization that they should join. Things like what our growth verticals are in the market. Um, things like, did we hit our revenue targets that paid out the bonus that you would be eligible for if you joined the organization? And not just focus too heavily on some of those superficial metrics like Kendra mentioned. I, I will do. A shameless plug. Um, I have a book. It's called Ask Me This Instead, and it's written for the candidate to pursue like the job search and interview process with more power and more access. And so it also includes a list of questions that I think you should really focus on in asking and putting the organization on the spot. Um, I wrote it because so often we put a lot of thought into assessing talent, and it's a mutual relationship. And so I think we should be as structured in our interview process and as demanding of companies and hiring managers as they are of us. Um, and so check it out. Ask me this instead. <laughs> love it. Love the, awesome. love the plug for the book. That's great. Um, that kind of makes me think about as, oh, do we have a question? We have our first question, ladies and Go gentlemen. Ahead. Can you stand up and say it loud? And we'll repeat the question. <laughs> uh, okay, so from a candidate perspective, I was thinking what's the most appropriate way to ask about startup financials? Because, like recently, I joined one and they were like, oh, don't worry about it. It's super comfortable, we're great. And now we're already going through layoffs. Okay, the. Absolutely. So, so the question is about how do you ask startups about funding their finances, their positions in more, a more professional, eloquent way without feeling like you're, you're being aggressive or over the top? Okay, I'll take this one. Um, I think the easiest thing you can do is express passion. Um, a lot of times if the companies aren't posting on LinkedIn um, about their venture capital or investment fundraising things, which I know might be bad to see, um, ask them and say, I'm really interested and I really want to, you know, dedicate myself to this project. Can you tell me who all is also interested in this idea? Um, we typically do an all company meeting and once a month we will tell people these are our new investors. This is what it means to us. Um, I think additionally with layoffs, it's understanding that sometimes it's an analyzing market fit. So if you've built the company up in one direction and realize that market fit would realign certain roles or create new opportunities, you will see some layoffs, but they may not be because there's no funding. It might be because that funding will be better utilized in a different area. And so I would try to see if you can bring in your marketing, your leadership, your HR and talent teams to have those discussions with you, but also encourage them to be as candid and transparent as possible. Um, I'll tell you, excuse me, <clears throat> from a leadership perspective, sometimes 
you know, we as leaders need to hear that folks not only want to hear this information, but they can absorb it and, and not necessarily, you know, hurt the messenger. And so if there are opportunities to really open that dialogue, express your passion, and, and tell them if you've gotten enough information or not enough, I think that will really create the dialogue that you're seeking. I mean, I think you could take kind of a, a just be very human about it, right? If, they, if, they, if they're interviewing you uh, for skills they hope you have, and you said, ah, I got that, don't worry about it. Uh, I don't think they would stop asking you questions, right? So put that back towards them. Ask them a little bit more about their customer base. You know, ask them about some of their larger customers they might have been expanding. Ask them how they share financials with their organization. Uh, ask them about their runway. There's ways that you can approach that in a way that's very trusting instead of saying, will I have a job six months from now? Yeah, I think you could also speak to the market as well. Like there are things going on in the market that are layoffs. You know, I'm looking for a company that I can stay with for the long run. Like what can you tell me that will that will help me to feel comfortable with that change too? You know, on that note, in one of our other conversations, we were talking about um, startups and if you're looking for a new role or something like that, how do you gauge if you're a good fit for a startup versus another size of company? Like, and how has startup culture changed maybe in the last five years or so? Um, so I would say startups are always going to be fast changing. That's the number one thing. If you're a person that doesn't like change, you probably don't want to work at a startup. Um, the other thing I would say is back to values. Like, what are your values? Do they align with the company? Um, can you see yourself working there for the long term? Um, can you see yourself really bringing those values in day to day with the people that you work with and holding them accountable to the same values? Those are, those are probably the two biggest things that I'd be looking at for a company. I think what's changed over the last couple of years is obviously the, the power dynamics have evolved and I think there's a lot about that that's really healthy and really important in that we as individuals, as organizing movements, even within tech, are starting to change the, the structures that have existed for generations and created boundaries and constraints and really put all of us at the service of companies rather than um, partners in mutual success. And so I think that's something that's changing. I don't think that it's something that we've like seen how far we can go um, or what the true impact of some of those movements and patterns will be, but I think it's really promising um, because I think that that's one of the things that with access to information that we have, we have more information now than any employee ever has, um, whether that's like we can get Glassdoor reviews or we can have more conversations or we know what pay, especially here in Colorado, looks like at different companies. I think that those are just the, the, the little igniting catalysts of something that could truly start to make work a better experience, not only for the people who stand to make the most benefit, those at the top, but also for the rest of us. And so I think the pandemic, as terrible as it has been, and some of the social movements that have started to um, take off, I think they're promising and I think they're going to be painful to continue to work through, but I hope that they actually create real change and sustainable change um, from like systems that are, have been outdated for generations, candidly. Christina, does this light a fire with you? Like we were talking about holistic HR yeah. in our call earlier. It feels like a good segue into what you were expressing in that respect. Can you tell the audience about your your views on holistic HR, yeah. what that means to you? Sure. So, so I think you know, as as talent and people or people experience whatever you want to put put on on us as a team. Um, need to realize that people can no longer or no longer want to leave themselves at the door. You know, if you have a bad day or if your kid gets hurt, if you get in an accident, if you're just down because you read the news accidentally. Um, <laughs> I think there's just going to be a notion that, you know, HR and people teams are going to have to be more holistic in their approach to how to treat one another and how to honor how you're coming into the door each day and how do we as as a leadership team do that, but also how do our, how do our team members come back to us and tell us I need more in this area? Um, I don't just need a mental health day, I need to see leadership taking those days off to encourage me to do so, so that I know I feel safe. I don't just need a discount to, you know, to some app that will help me meditate, I need less reasons to need to meditate in the bathroom uh, during the day. How do, we, how do we create a holistic style um, that truly honors people in work and not just people doing work. Um, and so I, I think the, the notion of holistic HR will hopefully spread. I think we've seen it 
through some of the benefit uh, packages that you saw 2019 to now, you have seen a lot more companies trying to enhance the mental health perspective. They're trying to get you better health benefits with less impact as far as co-pays. They're additionally trying to figure out how do we operate as a cohesive unit in a way that doesn't destroy the person. Um, startups will typically lead to burnout and you'll be there maybe two years before you're just tired and you need to sit and rest. How do we, as a company, address burnout through benefit, um, you know, operations, and just a general human package? And I think a holistic approach towards HR will definitely try to address those issues. Oh, question. So, what is the I mean, I will, I will tell you one of the things, if you are doing a number of interviews, try and ask people what their last bad day looked like. Who supported you during that last bad day? Um, you know, I would also check and see if people look like they're putting a mask on. If you are in an interview and someone looks a little too chipper for that kind of industry and for that kind of output and reward, <laughs> recognize the mask for what it is. Um, additionally, I think you have to analyze yourself. You know, is this an environment where you get a good vibe? Um, do you feel like everyone's lying to you or do you feel like you can truly trust those people? Um, if you don't feel the trust, I would not go into that environment because the hardest part is you trusting others as much as them trusting you. Um, so I would, you know, find ways to kind of pick up those notions. If that's not something that I think aligns with some of uh, some folks' uh, abilities, I think picking up, you know, mask or, or vibes or, or small little details in, in uh, body language can be difficult. Um, you may just want to ask flat out, hey, this is something that I'm really interested in. What do you all do to encourage a mentally encouraging environment that makes me want to drive myself harder but not to the point that I'm burned out? Do you recognize burnout within your company? Um, and what have you done for those employees that have experienced it? I think those things are tough conversations, but it also lets them know your energy coming into it and who you want to be leaving it. Go, go ahead. Two questions. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, avoiding burnout through benefit. Um, how involved do you see HR being in uh, reducing the cause of burnout? Um, you know, I think it's, it's going to be a team process. So HR typically is not there for the day-to-day -day projects that create the instances of burnout. Um, but I think one of the things that HR can do is address if someone's coming in with signs of burnout from a former role. Burnout typically takes about four years to recover from if you're doing all of the work and, and you've really got to unpack a lot. So a lot of folks that come into a startup world or a job, you will come in with some sense of burnout and the new role will only compound to it if you haven't addressed the previous factors. Um, HR specifically can definitely encourage the utilization of mental health benefits, trying to find a therapist or a counselor that can help you unpack things, finding a good new hire buddy so that you can ramp up and have someone to talk about with those small questions. Um, but additionally, hearing what new benefits we need. Uh, I will not say that I am a constant expert in every benefit possible, but what I will say is that I try to be an open ear so that if folks see something that they like and that we can sign up for and distribute out, um, I definitely want to make an impact where we can. So I think HR um, can take the lead, but we, we can't carry the entire load alone. We still have your question. Would anyone else want to address that before your question? Yep. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, no, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about um, around holistic HR, uh, you know, I think it's one of the one of the bullet points you see in a lot of startup job descriptions is must be comfortable with ambiguity. Anybody who manages people should also be very comfortable with ambiguity, right? Because everybody requires something different. Uh, I think over the last couple of years, people who have transitioned to work full remote who haven't historically been remote are also recovering from that. Uh, how do I 
show dem or demonstrate value in, in this remote environment that I'm not used to, and they take on a lot more. Uh, and where HR has played a big role, I think, in the last couple of years is really revisiting some of the management fundamentals of setting proper goals, setting those success metrics that, that really matter, uh, telling people that I'm not going to reward you for working 60 hours. In fact, I'll reward you more if you get the same job done in 40 and take a break. Uh, revisiting some of those management fundamentals, I think, has been a huge role of HR in the last couple of years. The thing I was going to add is that not all companies have the luxury budget-wise to add all of these mental health benefits. And so I think you can go back to some of the basics of literally building a relationship, making people feel, feel comfortable and safe, and um, you know calling them out if you hear that they're working on the weekend or working 60-hour weeks and in a kind, human way, um, and just really building that relationship to show them that you're there and that you care and that um, you want them to feel like they can be themselves at, at work. You still have your question? So kind of along the same lines, um, you know, we've had such a toxic culture in tech, especially for many years. And what I've seen is very talented engineers that are so used to this toxic culture, trying to bring them into the fold and identify the ones that you can get to come on board with your more healthy culture versus the ones that are stuck in their ways and are going to detriment. What are some of your techniques for kind of identifying and separating those two types of people? If you want to bring, obviously, you're in a limited talent Ooh. Um, great question. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the things, I think burnout like often gets um, described as like too many hours, but burnout means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Toxic work environment can be relations, relationships, it can be the nature of work, and it can be the product, it can be all different types of things I think contribute to those aspects of a work experience. So I would really try and understand for people like what their motivators are, where they have, where they are in their journey and relationship with work. So. I can be like working 60 hours a week on a problem I'm super passionate about and I will not meet burnout at all. I can work 25 hours and have a bad relationship with the nature of work I'm doing and I can be burnout, uninspired and depressed. And so I think one of the things to do is really talk about like how you want people to relate to their work. What are the permissions and freedom that you give them to do the work um, that they do best? Um, and what are the small number of boundaries or constraints you're going to put on them that are like intended to help the company achieve their goals? And have a more exploratory, more mutual partnership versus like an interview, which is me asking you, like, what, what makes work work for you? How do you like to run your day? How do you like to run your week? Um, and how can we see how that like integrates within our broader team constructs? And I think for developers in particular, there can be a lot of creativity in the way and the time frame and the pattern of how they do their work, whereas certain other teams, people team, like we might have to like work more traditional, meeting-oriented cultures. Um, and, and so I, that's how I would explore it, is like, what's the root cause? How do, you, how do you frame your work environment to like be responsive to diverse people's needs and, and ways of working? Um, and if you encounter people who ask questions about burnout, ask them what burnout means to them. So you can understand, is it about volume of work, nature of work, relationships at work, what? Um, because then you can better triage and say, we can respond to you, or this isn't going to be the place for you because we need to go live in like six months and we are going to be pulling 60, 80 hour weeks. Man, the questions are just coming. I love it. We have another question back there. All right, so my, my question is on kind of remote work and remote work culture. So it's on. That was my next question. Attracting people and retaining people. A lot of the conversations so far, it's, it's kind of felt like more, I don't know, like in, in person culture. Like if you think about trying to create teams and build teams to attract people into a remote work environment, any thoughts on best practices and kind of what you need in order to do that? Yeah, so I, I mentioned that uh, my company is in 46 states. We only have two offices actually in Virginia, so the vast majority of our workforce is remote. We have some areas that are, uh, we call talent densities. So like we've got 30 people in Colorado and we'll try to make every effort to bring those uh, Coloradans together. Uh, but there are some things that you, know, you, you don't have in a virtual environment that you had in an office environment that sound really cheesy to do in a virtual environment that still work. Uh, so like for instance, I have an hour every week with my team where I just get on, we get on Zoom and we just work together side by side. We don't have to talk. Somebody picks the music. I got a, we have a rotating G, DJ duty, and we just work side by side, even though we are in, in completely different locations. 
Um, I think that works. Uh, I think finding other areas that are important to your culture, like um, community is really big for us, and community means really different things when you're geographically dispersed. Uh, it's not just the community surrounding your HQ if you're in 46 states. Uh, so again, really cheesy, uh, bear with me, uh, but we do this thing called like coffee challenges, where instead of going and spending the $5 or probably $7 with inflation at Starbucks uh, these days, uh, we challenge you to jump on a Zoom, have a cup of coffee, no agenda with somebody, and instead of spending $7 at Starbucks, donate $5 to this nonprofit, which also was selected by our company. Uh, as kind of a way to build that team dynamic, even if you are geographically distributed, to talk to people that you don't talk to every day, and to give back to a community organization that we're pretty passionate about. Uh, so again, there are things I think that you can translate to a remote environment you just need to build that comfort level where it's like you're going to be a little uh, uncomfortable sitting there uh, working side by side with somebody when you're not in an office. If you can create that you know, welcoming environment, people are going to do it. People like it. With virtual open office hours have actually been a huge hit for us, and I didn't think they were going to take off. I like that. I think that's super interesting. And like kind of on that note, how what other ways have companies had to embrace the complexity of remote work and what other policies have you all seen or experienced that you think are working right now? You know, I'll say some of the things that I've seen that are really successful are trying to meet people where they are, um, figuring out, hey, uh, for our folks that have kiddos or have, have recreational activities that they like to do after work, how do we create um, more bonding activities or networking and socializing during the day? And how do we honor that we need to take that time during work hours? I think additionally when you have folks across the nation coming up with a core hour standard for meetings, both honors folks that are in time zones that might fluctuate very differently as far as meetings, and it allows people to know, hey, we really want to make sure that when folks bring themselves to a meeting, they're not also having to worry about jumping in the car or dealing with traffic or anything else. Um, additionally, trying to do some activities that are a little easier remote. So I was at a company where we did pottery remote, oddly enough, and we sent everyone a kit to make their own pottery bowls. We had an instructor come on. You could just do that, and then if you wanted to chat inside Slack, you could. Um, we additionally did painting um, or ugly Christmas sweaters. They were ugly enough to see through any camera, and it was just a really great way to, to see who could bring in the ugliest Christmas sweater. Um, I think the hardest part for a lot of companies is getting rid of icebreakers. I think we can all agree, hopefully, as like a majority consensus, we're done with icebreakers. I really don't want to tell you what I'd bring on an island I don't know. I'm, I'm in a landlocked <laughs> state. It's not on my mind. Um, but, but I can tell you a cool Netflix show I watched, and we can share ideas, or I can send you a picture of my cat in the most adorable pose that only I will think is the cutest. Um, but I think getting to know that kind of person, it also, for people teams, it makes us human again. And you realize, I might have a bad day. Maybe I am super upset that I broke a nail, or that my omelet had a hair in it and it totally defeated the experience. Um, but I think giving that vulnerability, even through a remote environment, can help people see that, you know, that you are a person. And sometimes you do need, um, you know, a little validation. I will say the biggest thing for remote environments, show gratitude. When is the last time you sent a quick thank you message to someone and it wasn't public? When is the last time you thought of a drink someone might like and send it to them? Or just something that, that would really make their day because they did something for you, or even gotten that in return? I think that gratitude can help us in any environment. And by learning different ways to express gratitude to ourselves and one another, we can get through any adversity, which sounds super cheesy, but it really does mean a lot to get those little, those little reminders that someone is thinking about you or that they notice what you're doing. I'm going to clap for that. No, Thank I love you. That. That's great. Yeah. Here, here. Oh, yeah. Bravo. Um, just one more fun example that we've done at our company, which I thought people would not want to do every year, but they're very excited about, is actually each team comes up with a video at our holiday party that like, both gives a recap of their year and also is just total creative freedom to how they come up with this video. And these videos are hysterical. Like people love them, they live for them, and they remember them all year long. Um, and they get excited for the next year to do it too. So um, that builds the team across all of the seats too. I love that. 
Uh, I hope those stay within the circle of trust. Those can be super embarrassing later. Um, <laughs> and I'll always look at your cat pictures, but um, kind of on a structural note, I think like there's a few things. You have to really be rigorous and disciplined in your asynchronous co communication. Um, so I think you have to build in really good practices, not just meeting culture and time zone culture. I think that's important. And then the thing that I think is the elephant in the room is in Colorado, we're, we're lucky increasingly in a few other states, we start to talk about pay transparency. Um, I think if, you're, if you are in a state, we're all in Colorado, where there are you know, access to certain types of information like salaries, if you're gonna keep your New York or your Pennsylvania or your Florida employees in the dark about pay and other aspects of transparency that certain people are legally entitled to, I think it's going to break down. So I think like you have to be kind of the furthest along in like your transparency based on the states where you work in. And that's about like your parental leave. That's about other types of benefits. If, you're, if you have people in San Francisco, um, do they get a better parental leave because they happen to live in San Francisco versus someone who's in Arkansas? You really have to think about those things if you're going to be a destination for talent, not only in those like very generous or transparent states, but also in states where there are pockets of really great people who might be enthusiastic and ready to work for you um, or mission aligned. And so I would just think of like all of those practical considerations. And I always think about money, benefits, um, and uh, communication being things that you have to be super clear, direct, and like always working on in a remote culture to be successful. You know, flipping it back to the job seeker perspective, um, you know, we talked about in our previous call, like if you're looking for a job, like how do you get to the truth of what organizations are doing? Like what are, are they doing what they say they are? Are there processes and structures in place? Like how do you cut through the bullshit basically? I mean, ask, ask tough questions. And I mean, Kendra mentioned something earlier that, uh, that kind of stuck out to me. There is so much data available on the companies you're interviewing with. I mean, LinkedIn Insights is like running a background check on your blind date these days. Like you can be like, hey, I saw your workforce took a 30% dip last year. Tell me about that. <laughs> uh, ask tough questions, because they're there to ask you tough questions too. And this is a very much a bilateral experience. Ryan, you got a question back there? Yes, uh, so I'm gonna put this under the context of the Michael Scott Kobe relationship from the office. Uh, Bring it. Kind of in the opposite though, like how can employees actually give the love back to each other uh, without crossing any lines? Uh, really, yeah, like how, how can we take care of like the HR folks uh, make them, you know, feel like they're valued? Wow, love that question. Yeah. Read our emails. <laughs> Read the emails. Yes, yes. Read our emails. Um, I, I don't think I've ever heard that, so I think that's really uh, thoughtful. But one of the things I think I would love to see is people do rotations through talent and HR. One of the things that's like bugged me forever is that like we're people people, we're process people, but we represent and we serve the entire business, so we need more technical minds, we need more creative minds. We need more um, other functional sets of expertise within HR in order for us to serve um, all of you and your different backgrounds and your different like focuses within the business better. And so offer to do a stage or to like be a, a, a like core interviewer for a new role. Um, if there's a performance review process, offer to be like one of the champions or ambassadors. And I think those type of things, one, they give HR more credibility with the rest of the organization when we have people who are championing the, the programs and the processes that sometimes we feel exhausted by, especially for reviews. Um, so I think you'll make the, the, pro the programs better um, and uh, we'll learn something in the process. And so uh, offer to do a rotation in talent or HR. On, on that point, um, you can, if you're in a people ops role, you can also think of all the people in your company as your users, just like you would do user research for a product, for um, design, something like that. You can do it for people as well. And so ask those people, hey, can I run this idea by you? Like, what do you think as a person in this business? Um, what feedback do you have on what we're about to roll out? How do you think everyone else in the organization is going to react to it too? Uh, on a serious note, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the product leaders that I worked with who uh, left an impact on me, uh, she said, if you ever see HR in one of our team meetings, like, don't be surprised. They're a partner to us. And just actually saying that to her team sort of dispelled this like myth that HR is there to like hunt you down or something. Uh, to me, that was a really strong kickoff to a partnership with that leader. 
You know, I, I guess the biggest thing that I think of, um, if you allow us to build trust with you, because I know that it can be really scary sometimes to talk to HR, to tell them that you're having a bad day or tell them that your manager did something that you didn't like, or even to tell them, I'm thinking of leaving. I'm starting to look at other roles. And it's not that hard when LinkedIn is popping up those, those job searches to make it a little easier. Um, if you allow us to earn your trust and to be open and candid with us, it makes our job so much easier. Uh, I try to tell people a lot of times, I don't get a bonus on your suffering. It's not, I don't feed off of it. I'm not, I'm not a succubus. I, I don't gain anything. It actually, it's something that I worry about constantly is when I see that the workforce is not doing well. Um, but I also know that with Catbird and non-denominational holiday representation of HR in movies and TV, it takes a lot to earn someone's trust with the, with the role that we work. Um, and so any opportunity that I'm given, I try to promise people, I will do my damnedest to make you happy. I will do everything in my power to champion for you within leadership meetings and to give you what you're asking for. I also need a little trust if sometimes, like Sarah was saying, if the budget just has a constriction that I can't align with, but I'm gonna keep pushing for it for the next year. Um, and so I'd say anyone that's willing to let us earn their trust, I personally will do everything in my power to work for it um, and to show you that it was worthy. Those are some great thoughts, you guys. I really love that. Like, gen genuinely. Do you have any thoughts? Like that in particular? You got, got another question. Oh, question. Yes, we have two. You're on deck. Okay. Go. Uh, yes, loud and proud. This is kind of like Ooh. Loaded, <laughs> loaded question. Uh, question. Uh, if my response doesn't make sense, let me know. <laughs> um, so, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna deploy capital to hire somebody, right, and you want return, make sure you're investing right, right? Oh, like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Good luck. Bailey's um, value. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm totally paraphrasing, but the question was basically, how do you manage the allocations for the cost of talent acquisition and, and hiring in when you're managing HR? Mm. Thanks, Chris. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right. Uh, when I say you're going to deploy capital to hire somebody, make sure that you're also setting your investment up for success, right? One of the things that we invest really early on is onboarding. And I don't say that in like a, a fluffy sense that, you know, they should have a, a, a welcoming day one. Everybody should have a welcoming day one. That's table stakes. What's the 30, 60, 90 for this person look like? And what is your manager doing about it to make sure that person's successful at day 90? It's expensive to hire. It's really expensive to lose people. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really important as well. You could just make sure that before you even bring that person on board and you're interviewing for them, you already know what success looks like. So you're looking at what success metrics you're even going to look at for that person, for that role. Um, and then you have something you have something to look at, you have something to show them as soon as they come on board so that you can align, the manager and the, and the individual person can align. From a like budget and planning perspective, um, I think those uh, that data that you referenced is probably for a little bit later stage employee, it may not be for like pre-seed seed, series A, series B type companies where there are fewer resources, we tend to invest less. However, like as you were talking about that, I was like, why wouldn't we have a hiring plan where we allocate salaries, right? And we look at like equity and we start to like have a spreadsheet and say like, what should we do? What's our range? Um, why would we not say like, let's take, you know, X percent, 10%, 15%, some total it for the number of hires we're gonna have for the year, and let's say, is that? 
an L&D person? Is that someone in people ops or some other function that can help really support the broader team and like look at it not as like purely a headcount cost, but a headcount or a team investment? And I think I'm gonna propose that to some of my clients. It's like, let's look at headcount in a different way and making sure that for the people you spend time hiring, integrating, and getting up to success, how do we make sure that's not a six or nine or a 14 month tenure, but it's two years? Um, because it does really matter and attrition is very expensive. So um, I would look at it as like literally a line item on the budget and say if I have X many dollars, do I allocate that to training externally third party resources or is it actually a human being that I bring onto the team potentially ahead of the curve? And I think that when you like from the investor perspective too, when I think of how you pitch to companies like you, pitch that as part of the reason why you have a plus one on your headcount. They might look at you at seed and they're like, why do you have a talent person? Make the case. Um, I think that's super interesting and I'm gonna keep on thinking about that, so thank you. <laughs> question. You got a question over there, I think? The question is what types of benefits and what things are out there that are not just trendy, but actually impactful to bring on and to have a part of your benefits structure? Yeah, um, so I will I will just speak from what I've seen so far. Um, you know, Smarter Sorting, the company at where we actually don't tell people during the interview, um, but we will offer you a Costco membership since Costco is one of our clients. Um, we additionally pay for a National Parks Pass to encourage you to go outside. Um, I'm not gonna buy you the shoes, I'm not gonna make you go, but I'm gonna give you the opportunity to explore and be somewhere where there is no cell service, which just sounds kind of awesome to everyone. Additionally, because our company does have an environmental impact, we wanted to get you out in the environment to see what you're saving, and there's no better way than the parks. Um, I'll tell you a lot of what we've found as a company is to hear what people, what the barriers are for them to enjoy their, their personal life and their off time, or to hear what are the barriers in work and to try and address those through benefits. What are ways that we can impact it? And sometimes benefits will be training for leaders and teaching new communication styles. Sometimes it's you know one of those cheesy tokens that most people don't like, but other times it's something a little nicer. And so I'd say um, a lot of what I've seen is that companies are actually listening and they're analyzing what their workforce needs. Um, I guess going back to your question about onboarding, I think it's additionally trying to figure out um, with new hires and folks from a benefit and budget perspective, um, what is onboarding at your company? If you are a bunch of engineers that don't typically like to be around each other, what would that make onboarding? Um, do you need someone to kind of corral everybody and make them have a moment? Um, or would you rather just do straight you know, computer training and, and some of the rigidity? I think that will help you determine your budget, but it additionally from a benefit side helps us analyze what we need to do to fill in those gaps that might exist within the company. Uh, on my theme of sometimes cheesiness works, uh, so my company's Uninet, right? We have uh, this benefit called U-Days, right? We have open PTO. People can take PTO whenever they want. As long as they're balancing work and life, they can take as much PTO as well. Uh, but U-Days is like a permission that says, you don't have to tell us the reason you're taking PTO. Just code it as a U-Day. You, you do you. Uh, and it's super cheesy, but it catches on. Uh, same thing with like, uh, you know, Uninet, guardians of the universe. Uh, if they demonstrate our values, we recognize them that for that. Um, there's a, a lot of the benefits that we provide are, are, are going to be very um, well aligned with people who are competitively positioned like us. Uh, but the differentiators are the things that I think that really tie back to our, to our values. And sometimes that's really the small things that matter. I would say uh, generous and equitable parental leave is something that I have seen increasingly make a difference. Um, uh, and I think it's a signal to people that like you're going to value them through different stages of life, especially if your company skews like fresh out of school or earlier in their career. Um, and it just demonstrates that you will like appreciate that people take time, 
return from um, periods of time away and that they can reintegrate into the company successfully. So I actually think like a successful and generous and equitable parental leave is a huge signal culturally for what the company values and how they um, approach like belonging, inclusion, um, as well as their overall benefit strategy. So it's one of the things that I, I get asked um, earlier and earlier, not only by um, talent, but by founders is how should we think about this? We have five people. I work with a lot of seed stage companies and they already have parental leave policies. They have nobody who's expecting, um, but they know that that is something that talent is demanding. And so I, I use it as a good barometer and something that's important to think through in advance. You know, on that note, how do you capture feedback and responses from your team when you're trying out new types of benefits? Like how do you understand if something new that you've implemented is actually working for people or if they're like, oh, I kind of see this, this other company's doing that and I, I really am interested in that. Like how do you, how have you approached getting feedback on new types of benefits and new policies? I would say for us, we've been asking feedback both along, along the way, but before we um, you know, take that time each year to add to our benefits or reevaluate our benefits, um, rather than asking after the fact, before, like when we're going to implement them. <laughs> Make sure they want them first. Proactive, I like it. Yeah, I think we get more questions about our benefits when we proactively educate. So I mean, not everyone wants to show up to a 401k webinar, right? But the fact that you offer them, somebody's going to ask you more about your 401k matches. Your HR people should be deployed to the field, proactively providing those opportunities where they can learn more about what you're offering so they can ask those questions and provide uh, that input. Did you have a question? That's a really great question, and I think it's an important question, too. Slack did a survey last year of almost 10,000 workers, and 72% of them answered that a hybrid model is actually their preferred option. And so I think there's a huge drive for people to want to get back together in person. So the question was, how, how do you show the value? How do you recapture the value of getting together in person for things like networking and groups post-COVID? You know, I'd say ultimately it's going to be a bit of a trust exercise. Um, I am, I am by most uh, respects an introvert. I would gladly do this from home if I could have. Um, but I also understand that there are a lot of moments that you won't capture um, until you get to meet someone in person and realize that they're a lot shorter than you thought they were on camera. Um, but additionally, that they, you know, they might open up to you a little better. And so I think there's going to be value in trying to set up some in-person events that aren't necessarily um, sterile. Do something fun. Do something that you could only do in person and make it an enjoyable event. Um, you know, and then I'd, I'd say for the plugs, it's going to be a lot of networking. It's going to be connecting with folks to try and figure out, oh, hey, does so-and-so actually have access to a workspace? And does this person have a great way to send out a social media blast to get the word out? Um, and some of that networking will be in person, but some of it is also going to be some trial and error. And so I wish you the best of luck with the JavaScript thing, but I'd say definitely network as much as possible comment on people's posts on LinkedIn, try different methods and see what works for you and your personality style to really get what you need to communicate out into the open. Uh, 
uh, from like an HRAS standpoint, or are you talking like full engineering tech stacks? So just to rephrase, the question is about how do you analyze software products for onboarding for HR when you're trying to scale? Yeah, I'd say if you can, you know, if you've had conversations with leadership to figure out where you want to be, and then maybe the stretch and the realistic goal, that will tell you where to look as far as HRAS. A lot of times if you are talking to a salesperson, they'll tell you how far they can stretch um, and, and where it's not going to work. I would say one thing to avoid is a lot of times I see startups pick systems that are not long-term viable. And the hardest thing you can do in a startup is to keep changing things. To bring in a new system and make someone relearn something, it kind of makes you wonder, so why are we upgrading? Was it because we're growing or was it because you bought a piece of crap to begin with? Um, and so I'd say definitely vet the providers, vet the options and figure out how that aligns with your, um, your employees' needs. So if they need to see more of the benefit descriptions in that system, find an HRS that aligns with that. If they're more payroll focused, go in that direction. Um, so I think it's gonna be a series of round tables on your end as the internal team to figure out what your, your team's specific needs are and then taking that exact list. Like it's kind of like apartment shopping. Go in with that dream list and figure out the things you're willing to like chuck away for something else that's a benefit and you will definitely find an HRIS system you like. Um, or if you know some options that you're looking at, feel free to chat with me afterwards and I'll tell you if I've tried them and loved them or hated them. Yeah. I'll do a plug for Outsail. Um, so Outsail, their founder, Brett, is here in town. They literally help you just determine your HR tech stack, whether it's recruiting, performance, HRIS, or otherwise. And they do it free to startups. Um, so they get a rev share from the vendor if you pick Lattice or whatever your provider is. And so they provide detailed reporting. They have questionnaires. And they're objective. And this is what they do every day, all day long, is they talk with companies and they talk with HR tech companies. And so I've done a lot of RFPs. I now go to Brett and his team and refer Brett and his team every time I have to make an HR decision because it saves me a lot of time. They do a lot of the diligence on my end and I have been um, like just wowed and like pleased with the results. So Colorado startups support them or um, ask somebody who's uh, spent a lot of time in a lot of systems. Love it. Support the local. Well, I think we're up on time. Uh, which means get out your raffle tickets. Um, with that said, if you were in the audience and maybe you weren't comfortable asking a question or you didn't know if it was a good question or something like that, I know I speak for all of us where if you want to come up and ask us a question afterwards, we're here for you. Um, we'd love to help however we can. But can I have an enthusiastic round of applause for our panelists today, please? Thank you. Good. And uh, as I said earlier, before we started, their opening parties over at the Clock Tower on 16th Street Mall. I think it's 16th and Lawrence, something like that. Yeah. But that sh that's it. So we're going to give away two. So each each winner gets two uh, uh, day passes to Loveland. Okay. So bring a friend. Bring a spouse, bring a coworker. Okay? Gonna go chop chop. Oh, we got four more entries. Okay, this is worth it. Okay, here. Okay. Okay, here we go. Kendra, would you like to pick the first one? Okay, everyone start stomping their feet, create a, create a drum roll. Drum roll, please. Here we go, Kendra, no, Kendra's doing it. Oh, get your ticket in there. Yes. Okay, get your numbers out. Oh, it's not mine. 8022. Who's got an 8022? Wait, do you read the? Yes, yes. Okay, come find us afterwards, Dina. And then we're gonna do one more set of two passes. So if you haven't won yet, you still might win. Okay. Zero, zero, six. Chris. All right. Super. Well, thank you, everyone. 
soak the bone marrow out of Denver Startup Week this week. I mean that, like, you know, capture the essence, lean in, participate, make the most out of it. All right. Thank you so much for coming.